first a bit about the word solder. I get corrected a lot in my videos about the way I pronounce solder. Well, let's set the record straight right now. In America and most parts of the world, the L in solder is silent, like the words walk or talk. The British pronunciation can include the L, so the word would be solder. But in 40 years, I've never pronounced it like that or ever heard it pronounced like that. All right, now on to how to solder. Soldering is a mixture of metals such as lead and tin that is melted and used to join metal parts together. Consider that soldering is more like gluing with molten metal, unlike welding where the base metals are actually melted and combined. And since many of my projects require soldering, it's a good skill to learn. Now let's talk a little bit about the equipment that you'll need. The first thing you'll need is a soldering iron, which is used to melt the solder. Now, irons of the 15 watts to 30 watt range are good for most electronics printed circuit board work. Anything higher in wattage and you risk damaging either the component or the board. Now, if you intend to solder heavy components and thick wire, then you'll want to invest in an iron of higher wattage, like 40 watts or higher. Now, the main difference between an iron and a gun is that an iron is pencil shaped and designed with a pinpoint heat source for precise work while a gun is in a familiar gun shape with a large high wattage tip heated by flowing electrical current directly through it. For a beginner, a 15 watt to 30 watt range is the best, kind of like this one that can be purchased for around $10. But be aware that at the 15 watt end of that range, you may not have enough power to join wires or larger components. So as your skill increases, a 40 watt iron is an excellent choice as it has the capacity for slightly larger jobs and makes joints very quickly. Be aware that it's often best to use a more powerful iron so that you don't need to spend a lot of time heating the joint, which can damage components. Another variation is the soldering station, which is what I use, where the soldering instrument is attached to a variable power supply. As you can see, I can control the temperature of the soldering iron. The only downside is the price, as these units can cost much more. In this case, the soldering station that I have, you could pick up for about $150. Now, they even have these little portable soldering irons that run off butane. Uh, they're handy to have, not quite as good as a regular soldering station, but in a pinch, they would work if you're in the field working and had to solder something really quick. Now onto the solder itself. There are different kinds of solder, but only a few are best for electronics work. You always want to use rosin core solder, whereas acid core solder is common in hardware stores and home improvement stores, but meant for soldering copper plumbing pipes and not electronic circuits, so keep that in mind. If acid core solder is used on electronics, the acid will destroy the traces on a printed circuit board and erode the component leads. It can also form a conductive layer leading to shorts, and we certainly don't want that in any of our components. Now I use solder that's around 0.032 millimeters in diameter and a 64 rosin core. Now the 6040 means that it's 60% tin and 40% lead. For most printed circuit board work, a solder with a diameter of 0.025 to maybe 0.050 is desirable. Thicker solder may be used and will allow you to solder larger joints more quickly, but will make soldering small joints difficult and it will increase the likelihood of creating solder bridges between closely spaced PCB pads, that's the traces on the board. Remember that when soldering, the flux in the solder will release fumes as it's heated. Now these fumes can be harmful to your eyes and lungs, therefore you always want to work in a well-ventilated area and avoid breathing the smoke created. There's also a number of solder exhaust fans that range from $20 on up, so you might want to invest in that as well. And eye protection is always advised. All right, let's get to soldering. The first step is to warm up the soldering iron or your soldering station and make sure that it's fully come to temperature because you're about to melt a lot of solder on it. This is especially important if the iron is new because it may have been packed with some kind of coating to prevent corrosion. So I'm gonna put it up around 650 or so. It should be about right, right in that range. Now it's important to have a nice clean area to work on. I have a piece of leather here that I put down, which seems to be pretty good and it takes a lot of punishment and it's easy to clean off. And you're also gonna want plenty of light to light up your area. It also might not be bad to invest in a pair of reading glasses that are super strength because sometimes you're up really close on a lot of solder connections. And for a few dollars, you can get a helping hands. This is a magnifying glass 
and it has a couple of alligator clips that can hold your wiring down or your components and it's also adjustable you can tighten it and bend it in different ways so that's also a good little thing to have if you're going to start doing some serious soldering first step is to make sure that our soldering tip is nice and clean and there's a couple of different ways you can do that I use a little copper kitchen sponge that I've taken, scrunched up into a ball and put in this little plastic jar. And it makes for a nice and handy way to clean your soldering tip. Now this particular station came with this sponge setup, which I don't particularly like. You're supposed to dampen that and then rub your tip on that. Uh, I don't like it because it has a tendency of getting very dirty and it can also melt or burn as you see here. Now we're going to thoroughly coat the tip in solder. It's very important to cover the entire tip and you're going to use a considerable amount of solder during this process uh, and it will also drip. So be ready for the drips that will occur on your little area that you have cleaned up and keep your hand above the tip at all times. Keep applying solder and it will begin to adhere to the tip. This is called tinning and it will create a nice even coating of solder on your tip to make for nice and quick and easy soldering. Let's go ahead and coat it. And as you can see, those molten hot little balls of solder uh, are gonna stick to the table. Fortunately, when they're dry, they wipe right up. Now in the other tutorial video, I talk about the tools of the trade, things that are gonna be the most common tools that you will need for building some electronics projects and one of those is the wire stripper, which we're going to use right now to strip the ends of these two wires. We have a red and a black wire, and these are very small diameter. So we're gonna look around the 22 gauge, and we're gonna start off there, and we'll see how that works out as far as stripping. You wanna strip back a pretty good amount. Just apply that, squeeze, and then pull the insulation off. We'll do that to both wires. And just like that, you've got yourself two stripped wires and now we're going to get ready and solder those together. Now our connections are gonna to wanna to be insulated and there's a few different ways you can do that. The most common and the best method is by using heat shrink tubing. And these come in a wide variety of inside diameters and colors and thicknesses. Also, you could use electrical tape. Not a very good way to insulate wires because electrical tape doesn't last very long. It gets gooey under heat, so we really want to avoid using electrical tape. And lastly, there's also brush-on electrical tape. Now, this stuff is pretty cool because it forms a coating on electrical connections and it seals out moisture and corrosion. It's basically just a black material that you would brush on your connections and let dry. Okay, assuming we're gonna be using heat shrink tubing, you're gonna to wanna to cut a piece that's long enough to cover the areas of bare wire that are going to be soldered and also a little bit of extra insulation that's already on the wire. So in this case, I'm gonna trim, I don't know, about an inch or so. And that's gonna be our little piece of heat shrink tubing. Now, if your wires are already connected to another component on the other side, you want to make sure you put your heat shrink tubing on now or else you're going to realize that you soldered your connections together and you forgot to put on the heat shrink tubing, which I've done quite a few times over the years. Still never seem to learn my lesson because uh, you just kind of forget. There's a couple of different ways that we can join our wires together because they need to be mechanically joined together, in other words, twisted together before we begin soldering to make a really good solder connection. So in this case, I twisted the wire, twisted all the wires together to form basically one wire, and I'm gonna do that on both. Then you can take your wires and put them together, and then twist one over the other. And sometimes it's good to already have your wires in your helping hand, which I will do here. So now I've got the two wires you see that are joined together and they're pretty much ready to be soldered. Now the other way to do it is to leave all of the separate strands apart and just push the two wires together and then twist the whole bundle together. Now you wanna make sure that your 
wire is not thicker than the actual insulation. So you never want to just twist them up and bend it over. You want to have a nice, solid mechanical connection like that. Okay, now we're going to apply heat to the bottom of the wire joint you know, using the thicker section of the soldering tip. So we're just going to hold our tip there and the thicker area of the soldering iron tip will conduct more heat into the wire joint. So the thicker the wire joint, the more heat will be required. Uh, be careful because on thin wires with cheap insulation, you can actually melt quite a bit of it off if you overheat the joint and we don't want to melt our insulation. Once a joint is hot enough, we can apply our solder, not to the soldering iron tip, but to the wires themselves. And then you'll see if it begins to flow, if it's hot enough. Now this is not quite hot enough yet. As you see, the solder has not melted. So we're gonna keep applying pressure to the bottom of the wires and there our solder has melted, forming a nice, complete solder connection as it's flowing through all of the wires. Then remove your tip and let the solder settle. Then the last step is to push our heat shrink tubing over the solder connection we made and heat it up. Now you can possibly use the heat from your soldering iron. Uh, it might be hot enough to slowly melt it. As you can see, it's starting to melt. You don't wanna to touch the soldering iron tip to the heat shrink tubing because we never wanna really put anything on the tip because it will uh, could damage the tip and also uh, it'll smoke a lot. And you can see this is slowly starting to shrink. Now the best thing to use would be a heat gun if you have one of those. You could use a match at a distance or a lighter at a good distance and uh, let the heat shrink tubing shrink up under the heat. And that's how to solder. Thanks for watching this tutorial and being a super fan.